Hi there, and welcome to episode 11 of the OGV Energy Let's Talk Transition podcast. I'm Murray Melhuish, the uh, founder of Anit Consulting. We help businesses bring offshore technologies and services to market. I'm delighted to be joined today by Philippe Cavafian, Executive Director from Acker Horizons. Good morning, Philippe. Good morning, Warren. Um, can you introduce yourself and your company, please? Well, my name is Philippe Cavafian. I work as an executive director in Acker Horizon. Acker Horizon has been created in uh, July 2020 to focus on accelerating the energy transition by investing either in projects or companies that allow reduction of emissions. Brilliant. And uh, of course, the Acker name is well known in the energy industry. Um, Can you give us just a little bit more detail about the business, including its relationship with uh, Acker Solutions? Absolutely. Acker is a very large group, very visible for companies like Acker BP, who is the second largest oil and gas operator in the northern continental shelf. We have uh, Acker Solution, who is a very visible technical and industrial company uh, with uh, yard and manufacturing capabilities. And we have also less known companies uh, all the way to dig- digitalization with Ace and Cognite, who are uh, transforming the way we manage assets in uh, the energy sector. Also, we are present in uh, uh, very pioneering segments like um, health and nutrition. But uh, fundamentally, we have uh, 180 years history of industrial group. Uh, coupled with a very strong financial capabilities with the most uh, recent creation of uh, industry capital partners, uh, where the plan is to invest uh, up to 100 billion in the energy transition within the decade. Brilliant. And what can you tell us about your projects in the energy transition, Philippe? Ake Horizon is investing across a broad range of geographies and technologies in the energy transition, almost uniquely uh, positioned across multiple segments. So when I talk about geographies, we have uh, about 1,200 employees present in 18 countries, all five continents. There is uh, also uh, a broad range of technologies that we are investing in for the energy transition, all the way from renewable generation, solar PV, uh, onshore wind, offshore wind, both uh, bottom fix and uh, floating technology. And we are present also in the carbon capture, utilization and storage. And uh, we are investing in hydrogen hubs and derivatives. So basically, green hydrogen, ammonia, and uh, uh, green iron. Yeah, that's really impressive, Philippe. And you know, I can't think of any other company that's involved in so many parts of the energy transi- transition. So I think we'll have lots to uh, to talk about today. Um, on this podcast, uh, we've met lots of different offshore wind developers, which has been brilliant. And of course, I'm sure a lot of our audience are familiar with uh, Mainstream, of course, the developer of the NNG wind farm here in Scotland and Hornsea and, and so on. Um, but I'm I'm really interested in your uh, involvement in capture, carbon capture and storage and uh, and and hydrogen. Um, tell tell us um, carbon capture and storage. You know why why does it matter? Well, if we want to reach the the net zero objective by 2050, what we know today is that we need to accelerate and deploy much more of the existing technologies. And that's uh, starting from more renewable generation, massive scale up of renewable generation. We have to consider vectors that are not just going going to be electricity, and that's why green hydrogen makes a lot of sense to allow green electrons to transform into green molecules to be transported uh, far away and also to be stored uh, across uh, multiple days and seasons. But we also know today that we need to capture emissions, CO2 emissions, 
before they go to the atmosphere and uh, some industrial application will require that we continue using them but minimize the impact on emissions and for that carbon capture there's a different technology we have decades of experience of a technology that has been proven in uh, in the north sea in the oil and gas on oil and gas platforms and we see this uh, carbon capture technology that is basically trying to capture the emissions at the source before they are more difficult to capture like for example the direct air capture technology will try to uh, absorb the emission the, the co2 from the air and we here we talk about capturing the emissions and using them as much as possible and for sure storing them uh, before they are difficult to catch. So this uh, idea of capturing the CO2 emissions at the industrial site where they are produced is uh, an essential element of the, the roadmap to the net zero. Okay, but I'm sure um, some critics would say that actually we're better off focusing on green hydrogen and then not having the emissions at all in the first place. Well, one one asset uh, that we enjoy in IK Horizon is the ability to combine these technologies and not uh, have one competing against the other or posing. Uh, so this uh, inclusive approach to the full roadmap that is needed to, to meet our objective and uh, mitigate the, the, the climate change. Uh, for example, green hydrogen and uh, carbon capture are not too different and open uh, in, in this roadmap. You can imagine that you capture the CO2 and you would combine it with hydrogen to uh, generate what we call e-fuels. And, and this uh, uh, genesis of uh, synthetic fuels that are going to be needed for some uh, very difficult to abate transportation modes, they need a carbon source. And so capturing carbon or producing green hydrogen are absolutely not, uh, I would say, uh, opposite uh, technology segment. They can be combined. And the development of hydrogen cluster are quite often, or the, the development of renewable generation are quite often combined with reusing a CO2 uh, that is captured from an, an refinery or an, an industrial process. And that's the best way to uh, capture the, the, the CO2 and use it in order to recycle it as opposed to increase the emissions in the atmosphere. Okay. And, you know, you talk about uh, hydrogen cluster there, Philip. Um, I guess that includes, I mean, we've mentioned blue hydrogen, which is hydrogen, including CCS and green hydrogen, of course. What can you tell us about those projects? You know, give, a, give us a flavor for them. This is another um, opposition that we tend to refrain and, and uh, encourage transition uh, requires starting from where we are and moving into a better world. And where you look at the current uh, industrial uh, and uh, the energy sector today, uh, considering that blue hydrogen would have to be avoided and we should jump to green hydrogen, then you, you end up with two issues. The first one is you don't have the infrastructure. Uh, usually, if you want to produce green hydrogen, you will do it in places where the sun is shining or the wind is blowing very strong. And that's usually not the place where we installed many factories historically. And so there's a question of location of the renewable generation capacity and the use of the green hydrogen. And the infrastructure can be through grid, uh, actually not the most effective, can be through pipeline, which is the most effective way to transport hydrogen. And otherwise, you need to consider transforming the hydrogen into ammonia and, and, and uh, the transportation is a little bit more reasonable. But we are still talking about many transformation of the renewable energy to uh, decarbonize the industry. So that infrastructure has a timing that is uh, basically making the chicken and egg story about where is the demand and where is the offer how do we create the market of hydrogen is a big challenge if you just assume that you will have the green hydrogen competitive enough 
to create the infrastructure that allows the market to connect the industry that needs the hydrogen with the producer that is remote. So this challenge is going to be much more effective to resolve if we introduce blue hydrogen, which is basically a significant reduction of the gray hydrogen. So and we, we talk about 95% reduction possible from, from the emissions on, on, the, on the blue hydrogen. And that the scale up of that technology is a way to accelerate the volume of hydrogen that you can substitute to the gray hydrogen today. And that helps the market and the infrastructure needed for the, the growth of the volume of hydrogen needed in the decarbonization to create the room for the green hydrogen. So blue hydrogen is uh, easier and more effective to scale up in the immediate future. It will help creating the infrastructure and it doesn't exclude the green hydrogen because actually one will substitute the other over time. Great. And feel like when we say grey hydrogen, that's hydrogen that's split from natural gas. Is that right? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Um, without, without so, sorry, more. It's the grey hydrogen is without carbon capture, and if you allow carbon capture to keep your CO2 emissions under control, and and then you transport them and you store them in a safe place, then you have blue hydrogen. We have one project of that type uh, called Okra, where in the north of uh, in the west coast of, of Norway, we are associated with major industrial players to uh, produce a large quantity of blue hydrogen. And when we talk about pipelines that are going to feed uh, Germany over time with uh, first blue hydrogen and then green hydrogen, uh, we imagine that the volume might come with a combination of both at the beginning. Great. And uh, this is a notable change uh, in the, I would say, the energy security agenda has pushed uh, an evolution of the mindset around blue hydrogen. And even Germany is now uh, indicating an interest for uh, considering this transition vector. Yeah, it's an interesting project that actually, isn't it? Um, when do you think first hydrogen is going to be shipped to Germany? What does your crystal well, ball say? The, the the pipeline will take, uh, I mean, in the best accelerated agenda, we talk about infrastructure that take uh, a decade to build. So if we have it by 2030, I think this is the, the announcement that was uh, communicated between Norway and Germany recently, this would be already an accomplishment. So that's why we cannot afford to ignore the benefit of feeding that pipeline when it's built with the volume of either green or blue hydrogen available at that time. Great. And, you know, the potential for uh, hydrogen in, in global decarbonization seems very significant. Um, do, do you think it's being overhyped in any way? You know, there's massive investment going into it. Um, I think overhype is, is, is the right way to look at the, the what we consider to be an hydrogen buzz. But at the same time, uh, we 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 go from um, an initial excitement uh, and, and and that's positive because it it drives a lot of attention and interest of the investment community. Uh, but the reality is that since four years ago, because uh, I was in offshore wind, we saw the benefit of using hydrogen as an essential ve energy vector in the energy transition. So. Uh, I'm a fundamental believer that hydrogen will play a significant role. But we need to put things a little bit in perspective in terms of substituting uh, the current volume of energy uh, that we get from uh, fossil fuels uh, with hydrogen. And hydrogen doesn't really make sense in all type of applications. So there's a big debate going on in terms of uh, should we use it for the very specific application where it's uniquely positioned to reduce emissions? And I think this is the right way to look at it, which is starting from replacing the gray hydrogen we use today in fertilizer or in other industry, substituting this with green hydrogen. It's the first step that is very logical. And there's also some industrial application where hydrogen will be needed to reduce very hard to abate sectors like the steel industry, the cement industry, 
and there's large, a huge volume actually of hydrogen that will be needed if we concentrate on these very difficult, hard to abate industries. Great. And um, I guess, you know, usually for an industry to adopt a fuel, um, it needs to be cost competitive, of course. Um, at what point do you see sort of economies of scale kicking in and can we commoditize hydrogen? Well, hydrogen, as uh, right now, the, the biggest challenge is the cost of energy. Uh, that is uh, a good uh, 60 or 70 percent of the cost of uh, uh, producing hydrogen is directly related to the cost of the energy you put in the electrolyzer. So uh, a first approach to this, of course, is to uh, locate the production of hydrogen in places where either solar PV or uh, wind conditions uh, are excellent. And, and uh, in that case, you would have a very low cost of energy that is reducing the cost of green hydrogen. The truth is that, like we discussed before, uh, these locations are usually quite remote from the place where we have the demand for hydrogen in those industrial processes. So the question there is, what is the best way to transport it? Uh, like we uh, notice with uh, natural gas, the best way to transport a gas is a pipeline. And the only effective way to transport hydrogen is through a pipeline. So this positions the North Sea or the uh, South Bank of the Mediterranean as excellent places where we see uh, a, a network of pipelines that could fit the European needs. In other places of the world, like in the US, you have also uh, industrial hubs that are very well equipped to uh, have a gas network or that can be adapted or actually in some cases like uh, uh, in, the, in the case of Netherlands, we already have um, a gas network that is uh, suitable to become the start of the backbone of the European uh, backbone of hydrogen. So as much as possible, trying to uh, build on existing infrastructure from the oil and gas industry and build from there a specialized network for hydrogen is the best way to consider the transition. Yeah, and I guess thinking about it, then that makes uh, your interest in both uh, offshore wind and hydrogen a pretty obvi obvious combination. They're very complementary with each other. Yes, we can see, uh, I mean, just picking two examples, the, the North Sea, uh, in, if, if you go up north from, from in the UK, uh, the more you look at the potential of the Scotland wind resources, uh, and, and the grid infrastructure, uh, th there's an obvious uh, transition that would build at one point in time local production of hydrogen and a pipeline transportation because over long distance hydrogen or gas transportation is, is more effective than, than grid uh, transportation of electricity. Great. And um... I mean, you mentioned operations in South Africa, Chile, Norway. Um, what, what other countries are you involved in, Philippe? Well, uh, this is a unique uh, broad spectrum of activities that we cover. If, if you consider the three segments of activities where ICA Horizon is investing, both uh, renewable generation, we have a, a, a combination of new geographies where mainstream renewable power has positioned uh, development activities quite early. So we are uh, quite present in Chile. We have 1.1 uh, gigawatt of uh, solar and wind in operation. We are uh, very strong in South Africa where the energy needs are quite significant and uh, a track record of uh, mainstream renewable power is very appreciated to deliver additional renewable capacity in a predictable manner. Uh, we have also historically uh, uh, for offshore wind the position mainstream quite early in Vietnam. Uh, and uh, if you consider the, the recent contribution of Scott Wind, we are present in the north of Scotland. So again, there a project that could generate power or maybe power to feed uh, uh, green hydrogen production. Uh, that's and and maybe transforming into e-fuel. So I mean, this these are the full 
I would say, integration of the technology I mentioned before. So uh, quite broad presence, uh, both in the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere. Of course, we are quite uh, focused on the North Sea, which is our uh, traditional, uh, I would say, it's our turf. Uh, when you look at the, the history of uh, the Acker Group in the oil and gas industry, we have a very strong industrial uh, experience uh, for floating and uh, fixed uh, assets in the North Sea. So we are quite attentive to the, the coming opportunities in Norway for offshore wind. And uh, we we consider UK as the still the, the biggest uh, market for offshore wind in, in Europe. And the Celtic auction that is coming is also an area where uh, our expertise in floating in particular will help us uh, uh, differentiate. Great. So, you know, Acker Horizons then is actually a really global company, you know, dealing with multiple different countries, different cultures. Um, what advice would you have to um, to companies looking to get involved internationally? You know, how do you get and keep these local communities on site? Well, Local communities are essential to support the energy transition. The, there is, uh, um, when, when we move from uh, a very high density source of energy like oil uh, is, and that is, I would say, remarkable to be, uh, once it's extracted, easy to transport, and, and basically it's a global commod commod commodity. When you go into renewable generation, and you are now focusing on reducing the emissions impact in every sector of activity, then you have to consider a much more decentralized source of clean energy. And what it means is that you start building in people's home, garden, uh, coast, uh, basically assets that are generating energy. And the only way to do this is by engaging quite early with the local communities, uh, sharing the benefit of this uh, decarbonized source of energy or transformation project for the industry, and making sure that there's a benefit for a sustainable development of the local community as well. So basically, if the clean energy transition will mean that we relocate industries and in other places of the world and everyone is losing their job, uh, that's probably not going to be the best way to save our planet because we won't get the political support for the energy transition. So when we talk about fair uh, energy transition, it's as important as, I mean, there's a technology angle to it, there's a scalable and uh, economical uh, uh, dimension to making this a success for the businesses. But there's also fundamentally a benefit for the local communities that has to be considered upfront. And so everyone needs to have a role to play and a life to live in the future. And this is doable because the new technologies and the new project bring new opportunity for job. But I think it's quite important to prepare that transition. And part of that is anticipating the right skills that we will need. Anticipating the right skills we need, that's uh, extremely difficult. Do you think enough's being done in that area? You know, how, how, can, how can we improve those skills for the future? Um, I don't think it's difficult. I think we know, uh, we, we know that uh, if we want to do five times or ten times more production of renewable energy, we will need the skills of uh, the people that are doing solar PV today or onshore or offshore wind. We, we simply need to, to make sure that we prepare early enough the curriculum the, the 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 from from the school the university all the way to the early assignments in the jobs we prepare people to uh be i would say both ready for some jobs but also uh, willing to evolve uh, a lot of what i do today didn't exist when i graduated from my university uh i've been more than 20 years in the wind industry. Basically, it wasn't a topic we studied at school. 
but it's uh, an essential pillar of the energy transition today. So the idea that, uh, for example, a good part of the technology we need to succeed in the net zero agenda by 2050 are still technology that needs development and maturing today. And this uh, ability to understand that maybe in 10 years, the world will look a little bit different than the one we see today. Well, that's part of, I think, what we need to uh, give as a, as a basic training. Great. And are there any other major uh, areas of challenge that you see for delivering projects of this scale? Well, there is a, the challenges are, uh, of, I would say, two major uh, issues. The first one is uh, we need to be able to uh, consider sustainable development in in the scale of what is needed. So uh, whether you look at the uh, access to some critical materials, all the way to critical technologies, the 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 skill set or the comp the the the, the the labor force that you need to be uh, deploying five or 10 times more than what we do today in the renewable sector, just for taking that part is essential. And, and so I would say understanding that you don't do 10 times more if you scatter your efforts, you, you need to professionalize and, and industrialize every segment of the value contribution. Uh, the the second element of this is is the, the idea that we would rely on someone else. I think is a is a a dream of the past. Uh, the the US will have many many opportunities to address their energy transition. China, Asia, India, so Europe, Africa. I mean everyone is going to be so busy doing what they need that the idea of uh, transporting components or competencies or shipping people international uh, expat uh, i don't think this is going to be anywhere close to the scale we need to succeed so we need to develop locally in every continent the capabilities to succeed in the energy transition the answer might be different of course depending on the grid infrastructure, depending on the uh, industrial activities, you start from a different baseline. But I think the idea that we will have uh, one way to succeed and we'll teach the rest of the world, um, that's an idea of the past, or the fact that we would depend heavily on one country producing all the uh, equipment, it's also an idea of the past because it won't be capable. OK, and, you know, what do you think about one growing concern in Europe, you know, the risk of switching from energy dependency into a technology or critical materials dependency, um, given the uh, given, you know, the competition between America and China or rather the USA and China particularly? Well, the, the risk is there uh, for for, I would say, uh, obvious reasons that to succeed in reducing cost and, and be uh, uh, delivering a competitive response to, to the energy transition, you, you need scale. You need scale and volume. And, and uh, both uh, China uh, and uh, the US, with uh, in particular the Inf Inflation Reduction Act, that uh, is a significant boost to attract investment into the US, they they will get the scale and the and the volume that require is required to basically get the critical mass and localize the competencies, the technology, and the, the 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 industrial capacities to deliver on their energy transition. The question then is how Europe uh, can respond to that. Well, it's not that different than what we do, but we need to do more of it and more aligned between the countries. So fundamentally, it's keeping a technology edge. So uh, maintaining high level of uh, research and development, uh, supporting prototype, I mean, through, throughout the range of technologies. So it can be in renewable, it can be in a small modular reactor for, for nuclear. It can, it can be also in carbon capture and all the things that help transitioning uh, and decarbonizing the industry. So I would say not focusing in one excellent segment, but also making sure that we have a consistent and strong 
uh, development in all the technology required. So I would include batteries, I would include electrolyzer into this. The second element is to simplify a little bit the, the rules to deploy at scale. And uh, when I say the rules, certainly permitting, uh, permitting for site development, but also allowing how we support some industries to scale up. And uh, there's a little bit of a complexity uh, in, in Europe. We like to regulate more than incentivize. And I think simplifying the way we make attractive uh, investment into uh, the positive impact technologies or projects for the energy transition is, is a must to help scaling up. And, you know, in terms of scaling up, you know, you mentioned um, five times or 10 times uh, growth. What sort of time scale would you put to the five or 10 times growth? Well, much more aggressive than what people tolerate to listen to today. The, the, the truth is that we are running out of time. Uh, I, I'm very confident on the ability for us to scale up five or 10 times. Um, the challenge is the the little music that we hear to i mean or we get used to that uh you know things will work out uh but the fact is that we need to transition and decarbonize much faster than what people are getting used to right now so the how much we need to do uh, to get to a net zero uh agenda in 2050 has actually to be defined between now and 2030, because that's where you want an inflection point. That's where you want to see a reduction in the uh, in the emission. And and there is a tendency over the last uh, two years to consider that uh, several crises are a good uh, excuse for procrastinating a little bit on that short term agenda. But the, the, the key the key message should be that we need to do more and faster because we we need to do two things one is to accelerate the deployment of what we know today is a workable solution but we also need to develop the new technologies and one is it's like we say in french it's uh, cheese and dessert you cannot choose one and prioritize one and forget the other because if we don't deploy in large volume what we know today for uh, the existing solution we will be in 10 or 15 years too late with the whatever new technology that can be a good complement to the solution. And so uh, just uh, I would say my uh, my mission is to is to basically share the sense of urgency on deploying in large volume the existing solution. For sure. So we need we really need a sense of urgency, no procrastination, and we need to uh, scale up the the workforce um can you give us a feel for the types of roles that are available and in demand for the scale up well in terms of roles the i'd like to dissipate a, a fake idea that energy is only for engineers uh i mentioned uh that we are basically creating assets or developing uh, energy producing assets in people's garden. So a lot of what we do is basically uh, uh, real estate. Uh, it can be access to land. It can be securing uh, a, a good consultation with the, the local communities. There's a lot about uh, the economics. I mean, you know that a lot of the renewable generation today is relying on a, a heavy investment upfront. And then people think that the sun and the wind are free, which they are, but the interest rate uh, that uh, you use to finance uh, heavy investment upfront are going up in the current environment. So there's a lot of financial uh, skills that are also required. And uh, I would also say that in terms of uh, uh, maintaining and operating these assets, there is a lot more than what people consider just the specialty of uh, uh, a service technician. Uh, the the other element that we see today, especially when we start talking about these new partnerships that are required to create the new value chain. So basically, 
uh, it's fine that someone is producing green electrons. Let's talk about the people who are producing green hydrogen. But the, the key new element is that we need the offtake. We need the users to be integrated into the solution. So how do I use hydrogen to decarbonize the process of green iron instead of having the current process? How do I support the sustainable steel industry to move into green steel, reducing a significant part of the emission? Same for the cement industry, the fertilizer industry. I would mention the shipping industry. How do we integrate the value chain and the, it's no longer a question of me pushing my solution, whether it's wind or solar or even green hydrogen, into the next one to take it. No, we need to integrate the need, the location, the transportation. We need to have a holistic system integration. And that's where I would say the roles. Uh, you can be a chemical engineer, uh, expert into a refinery process, and be a very useful character in the energy transition because that's where we will reduce the emissions. And if you don't include the people knowing their processes with the people knowing how you combine solar and wind to have the right balance of uh, what we call the capacity factor that we feed into an electrolyzer, how do you uh, feed continuously or not the production of hydrogen into ammonia or not? I mean, all these things require different skill set and i think this is the beauty of what we see today as the current stage of the energy transition is that if we focus on a decarbonized economy then you need to engage everyone to reduce the emissions and have a sustainable model for tomorrow great and philip i'm sure um a lot of our audience will be inspired uh by your um vision and sense of urgency which is tremendous if they want to get involved as a potential employee of Acker Horizons or perhaps even a, a supplier, um, how do they go about doing that? Well, it's very simple. Uh, Acker Horizon is an investment company, but the key uh, interface for the concrete opportunities, I would say, are going to be with mainstream renewable power, with Acker Carbon Capture, and uh, we have an asset development arm that is... Uh, uh, working on actual projects. And, and uh, so we have a project in Norway, in Ryukan, that is uh, building uh, green hydrogen. Uh, we have a significant industrial cluster that we are uh, building around Navik, where we will uh, uh, have multiple capacity, but including green hydrogen and, and green ammonia to, to export. So these are very concrete projects that uh, are going to attract a lot of needs for talent. Brilliant. And um, and I guess the, this need for talent and for suppliers, it's in each individual country too, isn't it? It's not just in Norway or not just... Well, uh, like we discussed, it's decentralized. So, I mean, the bulk of the operation of mainstream are located in Chile and in South Africa. We have, of course, uh, an office in, in Dublin. Uh, but uh, this is the uh, original uh, creation of, of the company. But uh, there will be also very strong operation in Ireland when people discover that it's very windy on the west coast of Ireland and we can build a lot of offshore wind and we can put hydrogen into a pipe and, and bring it back to Europe. So back to my combination of skills that we discussed before. But uh, the needs for people are going to be associated with the project. Brilliant. And uh, you know, Philip, I'd like to find out a little bit more about you, if I can. Um, can you take us a little bit through your, your career? How did you end up um, as a exec director at uh, Acker Horizons? Well, I have uh, been many years in the energy sector. I've multiple times been surprised by the changes in, in the industry and the uh, I would say uh, a lot of my uh, career development have been completely by chance. Uh, I mentioned that uh, wind did not exist when I graduated from school. So I uh, moved into uh, General Electric with uh, the vision that uh, 
uh, oil and gas and, and gas turbines were the perfect uh, match for using uh, my geographical interest for, for Europe, uh, gas pipelines. And, and uh, uh, I did work in the oil and gas industry, uh, specialized into controls, uh, robotics, uh, uh, controls of gas turbine and compressor. And that took me into something that we call services technology, the ability to monitor remotely gas turbines or compressors to become a little bit smarter in the way we do services. And um, it was uh, a very interesting time. Uh, the, the gas bubble in the US uh, was a time where everyone thought that uh, the gas would be the answer to all the energy needs, the power needs in particular. And then what happened uh, is uh, very simple. Nobody predicted that uh, after the gas bubble, there would be um, a very expensive price of gas because nobody saw the shell gas coming, uh, but everyone uh, got interested into wind at that time. So I got into wind in 2002 because uh, of an acquisition of uh, the Enron Wind uh, division from uh, uh, GE. And uh, although I'm a, I'm a passionate sailor, I, I like wind and I use it for sailing. I never thought I could use it for powering the, 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 the society. And uh, from that time, 2002, I've been onshore and offshore wind. Uh, many, many uh, opportunities that uh, did not exist at the time I graduated, but also I would say in 2002, uh, or even in 2010, people did not believe that offshore wind would be competitive. So now we are 10 years later, and uh, of course, wind onshore has become a success. But uh, what has been a convincing journey is the fact that uh, you can use offshore wind, bottom fix, and tomorrow floating as a, as a scalable source of clean energy. And so my, my path is... Um, basically a, a succession of opportunities that I did not decide or didn't, I would say, master in a super strategic plan when I was 20, because none of that existed when I was 20. And uh, I, if you want to follow me geographically, I've been working in northern Germany, in, in Denmark, and now I'm in Norway because uh, my new center of interest is the North Sea that can become the clean power plant of Europe. So it's easy to track. Just look at where it's windy and offshore, and uh, you will see me in the coming years. And look, that's a fascinating um, career history you've got. And uh, would, looking back at that career then, what advice would you have for a young professional um, looking out at the world, trying to decide what direction to go in? I think the... For me, the the biggest message is that um, I like to call myself optimistic by experience, but I've seen I've seen industry scaling up uh, with the factor of ten. Uh, I've seen gas turbine production going from uh, um, an annual production and then ten times more, uh, and then I've seen wind turbine production going ten times more. The the fact that we can grow uh, is is a, a message of confidence that I'd like to give to to the people starting, uh, believing that what you see today is not what you will get in five or in ten years. Uh, the the world is changing much more than people suspect. Uh, if you look back five years, ten years, or fifteen years, how many wrong forecast? I can list uh, and, and we can have a, a long evening of making jokes about how 30 years scenarios have been totally wrong in all the major companies. Um, but also uh, simply the, the, the lesson to take from that is that things will change. And so it's quite important to keep learning, to keep uh, to stay always on uh, a very open mind for what is a disruptive technology disruptive technologies sometimes end up nowhere but the one that are succeeding and can scale up will transform the world so uh, my major takeaway is uh, it's possible to grow but let's try to grow the success and the good uh, working technologies and not growing the mistakes
Great. And thinking about that success, Philip, um, how do you define success for Acker Horizons? Well, Acker Horizon, we incubate, develop and uh, exercise active ownerships in companies that are uh, meaningfully reducing CO2 emissions while creating, of course, sustainable value. So the re, uh, finding the solution of having a success, successful business story while driving the development of the key elements that are driving the reduction of, of uh, the emissions, I think accelerating the the um, energy transition will be by making sure that business success and climate change mitigation are one and the same. And I think this is the, what we do in Ike Horizon, being a, a pure player in that area. And, and Philip, how do you define success for yourself personally? Well, in my case, success is uh, for example, making sure that people uh, concentrate in making the North Sea uh, the clean power plant of Europe in the future. I think everything I can do to convince people that uh, we should do it and without waiting, I think this is probably my uh, next definition of success besides all the personal things because I have a family and I have to raise uh, two teenagers. So I think this is the, probably another good challenge. Brilliant. And Philip, the last podcast we recorded was with Claire Mack, the chief executive at uh, Scottish Renewables. Um, and she has posed a question for you. Um, her question is, uh, from your own perspective and the role which you occupy, what does good look like in terms of combating climate change and saving the planet? Well, for me, uh, like I say before, we don't do enough. So good Good is uh, probably uh, reducing reducing emissions between now and 2030. Uh, so I, until I see the inflection point, I will continue to worry. And when we look at it I, again, it's easier in develop the the developed uh, European economies uh, to consider that this uh, inflection point is achievable but i think it was done with the wrong solution we basically uh, globalized economy we like to import products and goods from places where i would say the energy mix is not the one we like so we criticize the countries where we import products from and i think this is i would say a fake inflection point that has been an illusion we have been building our uh, roadmap on and the real Inflection point is giving every country in the world the energy they need, but a clean energy. Brilliant, that's a, a great vision. Um, and Philip, ahead of this, uh, ahead of meeting you today, um, you were asked to set a question for our next guest without knowing who they would be. Um, can you let us know what that question is? Well, just uh, to echo uh, one very active debate today, after the Inflation, Inf Inflation Reduction Act has been uh, boosting the attractiveness of the US for most of the technology I mentioned before, uh, I think um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, your next guest, what is a very concrete uh, measure that uh, the, the, the guest would expect from the response in Europe to the Inflation Reduction Act to boost their domain of activity? Brilliant. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I uh, I certainly look forward to uh, to to asking that and and finding out the answer too. Um, so, Philip, that brings us to the end of uh, of our uh, our podcast today. Um, and I'd like to thank you, uh, Philip Kavafian, uh, Executive Director at Acker Horizons, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Perfect. Um, and as always, uh, you know, feedback on today's podcast and suggestions uh, for who we should have on and, and what questions we should be asking the leaders of the energy transition would be most welcome. Uh, feel free to get in touch directly through LinkedIn or by email. It's murray, M-O-R-A-Y, at anatconsulting.com. Thank you very much.